bunch of people online. Yeah. Oh. Like a yeah. large so number of people that, uh, are in their jamming group. Oh, people <laughs> online starting. Right? So, Jordan, give me the. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucinda Walker, and on behalf of the Norwich Public Library, I welcome you to our snapshot event Radicalized mu Racialized Musical Histories with Philip Ewell. My apologies. We extend our thanks to our partners at Vermont Humanities, as well as to the generous underwriters who make possible for us to offer such rich and robust programming. The sponsor of our entire snapshot season is the Vermont Department of Libraries and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Tonight's event is sponsored by Spades Puzzles, and the library would like to thank the Friends of the Norwich Public Library for underwriting this year's host fee. Tonight, we come together from across the state to listen, to learn, and to be inspired in community. Before we begin, I just have a couple announcements. One is, is that our next snapshot event hosted by the Goodrich Memorial Library is Dancing in the Street, Carols and Songs of the Holiday Season with Mark Howe, December 13th at 7 p.m. Be sure to register online to receive a link to the live stream. Um, it is now my distinct pleasure to welcome our speaker. Philip Ewell is a professor of music theory at Hunter College of the City University of New York. His specialties include Russian music theory, Russian opera, modal theory, and race studies in music. His public scholarship has been featured in news outlets such as the BBC, NPR, the New York Times, the New Yorker, and WQSR's ARIA Code. His monograph, On Music Theory and Making Music More Welcoming for Everyone, appeared in April 2023, and he is co-authoring a new music theory textbook, The Engaged Musician. Theory and Analysis for the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming Phil Yu. Thank you, Lucinda. Thanks to everyone at uh, Vermont Humanities and here at the Norwich Public Library. Uh, it's great to be with you, everyone in here and out there on the live stream. Um, <clears throat> let me fire up my iPad here and, uh, and we'll get going. So yeah, it's an honor to be here. Um, so just a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, there is a bibliography uh, for today's talk, so you don't have to write down any citations. If you went to my website and then to research and then to presentations, you'll see a little link for the bibliography. Um, I've timed this talk. It's about 50, maybe a little more than 50 minutes so uh, that you're prepared. Um, I, uh, the, the title of my talk is uh, racialized musical histories and you can see that i've highlighted histories in red and i'm also playing on the the duality between stories and histories right so i'll talk about that um, <clears throat> i will tell you that i'm going to ask you i'm going to challenge you to sit with a little bit of discomfort today um, because uh, that is something that naturally happens when we talk about uh, the history of race in our country um, and one final i guess i don't know disclaimer uh, you know that we're all living through a period right now where um, we are uh, moving away from responsibility, where our leaders are, um, it's, it's like when they are um, well, trying to lead, there's a lot of blame and people are not taking responsibility, right? And a lot of times when people discuss race scholarship, and I consider myself a race scholar among other things, people try to say that we are blaming white people or that white people should feel guilty for something. And I just want to impress on everybody before I get going that that is, of course, total nonsense. Uh, no self-respecting race scholar whom I know would ever try to assign guilt or blame to anyone at all. Uh, what we race scholars consistently talk about is two things, responsibility and accountability. Responsibility and accountability for white people, sure, but for everyone else included. It's extremely important for me to make that point. This is not about assigning blame or, or people uh, feeling guilty. Rather, it is about responsibility and accountability for everyone. And here I would uh, cite uh, one of my favorite race scholars, Kimberly Crenshaw, <coughs> who wrote, when it comes to racial reckoning, the future of our country depends not 
on whether we litigate who among us is guilty, but whether we all see ourselves as responsible. So two things, responsibility, accountability for everyone, something I tried to teach my 14-year-old son, Casimir, every day, though I hasten to add on that count, I am failing miserably. Uh, I hope you're not watching Casimir. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's get this party uh, started. Yeah, so but it's just you have to have these conversations, and it's just this weird thing. Like white people sometimes your response to stories of racism are just so troubling. And I'm talking about like I'm not talking about like the on the the right because the right has the same response. When you if you tell somebody on the right you had a racist thing happen, they go, "There's no such thing as racism." You go, "Okay, I'll block you on Twitter. And we're done here." You know, I don't gotta watch Fox News. I can turn the channel. You know. But then there's a thing that happens with white people who are your friends, who are on the left, and that thing where you go, where you go, hey, that thing I did was racism. They go, how'd you know it was racism? <laughs> See, everybody goes, oh, oh, people go, oh, no, yeah. How do, you, so you, do you get that response sometimes? How do you know it was racism? And it happens like this. How do you know it was racism? <laughs> with like a shovel step. How do you know it was racism? <laughs> Like, because I'm kind of an expert in this. I've been studying it my whole life, whether I wanted to or not. I gotta know. And let me just explain why people, this is what it sounds like when you say that to us, because I don't think you get how crazy that sounds. It would be like if I was to run into you on the street collective white person. And I was like, hey, what do you do today? And I was like, well, I got up, I ran some errands, and I had lunch. What did you have for lunch? I had pizza. How'd you know it was pizza? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, what are you talking about? Because I knew it was pizza. It was clearly said pizza. I have pizza almost every day. That's what I think is suspicious. How you having all this pizza every day? <laughs> There's pizza everywhere in the world. No, I don't see all this pizza you're seeing. I don't think you have pizza. Are you sure it wasn't pita bread with cheese on it? Are you sure it wasn't pita bread with cheese on it? <laughs> no, it was pizza. I've eaten a lot of pizza in my life. My parents ate a lot of pizza. My grandparents ate a lot of pizza. My great grandparents, my great 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 grandparents were brought to this country to make pizza, but they weren't allowed to eat it weirdly. I know it's goddamn pizza. How did you know it was pizza? And more to the point, how do you know if you are being pizzist? When whiteness tells the stories of our American racial past, it often gives skewed accounts and, in extreme instances, erases racial injustice from existence. Think here of the Tulsa, Oklahoma race massacre from 1921, which white whiteness effectively erased from U.S. history for nearly 100 years. Then, as is so often the case in the United States, these white stories get memorialized as history, an accurate retelling of events that can then be taught to and enshrined in the American mind. Yet when blackness tells its version of the story, blackness is often told by whiteness that that version is biased, emotional, and not rooted in fact. We blacks are told by whiteness that our history is divisive, that we are storytelling in a gather around the campfire children kind of fashion. And most important in our American racial fantasy, black perspectives must remain stories and never be considered histories which would puncture the bubble of whiteness's greatness, whiteness's nobility. In the case of the Tulsa Race Massacre, in which white mobs slaughtered roughly 300 black residents while displacing and terrorizing thousands more, the white media told a white story by immediately recasting the event as a riot, which sought to reframe the violence as legitimate self-defense. Stories ran about colored and white people dying in a riot. The fact that two whites had died took precedence over the slaughter of 300 blacks, and in a quick subsequent court case, the grand jury blamed Negroes for inciting race rioting while clearly exonerating whites. And in a case of black history, Viola Fletcher, at age 107, one of only three survivors of the massacre, one of them actually just died recently, Viola Fletcher is still alive, um, gave congressional testimony in May 2021, finally giving voice to a national audience of her first person testimony of the horrors of the massacre of black persons in Tulsa when she was a seven year old girl. In some languages, story and history are rendered by the same word, as in French, histoire, or Russian, historia. That is, stories and histories are two sides of the same coin. 
I'll let the listener decide for themselves whether I'm telling stories or writing histories today. But in either case, the racial aspect of U.S. history simply must become part of our narratives if we ever wish to confront the utter racial dystopia that we all now face. Today I'll discuss some of music's white stories in hopes of coming to a more nuanced version of the academic study of music. Throughout my talk today, I, as a black person, will be conveying a black perspective on these stories, a perspective that I'll suggest to you is black history. Toward the end of my talk, I'll discuss why our music curricula remains so racially segregated even today and offer a few ideas for a path forward. The white story of Western civilization and origin myths. <clears throat> Many scholars have shown that the idea that ancient Greece was the sole progenitor of Western civilization was at best spurious and at worst harmful, creating confusion and obstacles to, pro to progress. Historians such as Nell Irving Painter, who writes, without a doubt, the sophisticated Egyptian, Phoenician, Minoan, and Persian societies deeply influenced the classical culture of ancient Greece, which some still imagine as the West's pure and unique source. Kwame Anthony Apaya, who writes that Western civilization is at best the source of a great deal of confusion, at worst an obstacle to facing some of the great political challenges of our time. I believe Western civilization is not at all a good idea, and Western culture is no improvement. And classicist Rebecca Futo Kennedy, who writes that the concept of Western civ itself doesn't emerge until the late 19th century, and when it does, it is explicitly white supremacist. Notably, music's Western canon can also easily be tied to America's historic white supremacy. Perhaps the most significant historian to take on the origin myths of Western civilization was Martin Bernal, who in his three, uh, in his three volume Black Athena, in which he forms two models for Greek history, namely what he calls European or Aryan model on one hand and the Levantine or ancient model on the other. Ultimately, he suggests that we should replace the newer European Aryan model with the ancient model, one which accepts the fact that Egypt colonized Greece long before Socrates came along, a history that the ancient Greeks themselves acknowledged. This he urges because the newer European Aryan model was based on racist thought and white supremacy. Uh, one second. Of course, the concept of racial purity was an obsession of white supremacists, and the Aryan model of ancient Greece successfully promoted racial purity. Bernal shows that the creation of the European Aryan model of ancient Greece served as a perfect mythology to, to sustain and justify not just Western greatness, but its violent excursions across the globe and its rapacious lust for colonies outside of Europe. If Europe and its racial whiteness were to be put forth as superior, it would need a story to sell this superiority. And the European Aryan model of ancient Greece provided just that story. Unsurprisingly, Martin Bernal's landmark Black Athena caused immediate controversy. Perhaps the most ardent defender of the divine provenance of the ancient Greeks was classicist Mary Lefkowitz, who wrote a monograph, not out of Africa, how Afrocentrism became an excuse to teach myth as history. I find it telling that Lefkowitz adds teaching myth as history in the subtitle of her book, since teaching the ancient Greeks is so often exactly that. Think here of the almost certainly false story of Pythagoras at the blacksmith's shop, in which he divined through hammers a proportionate weight the intervals of the octave fifth and fourth. And for the listener here, I'll just say that uh, in music there is a mythology that Pythagoras went to a blacksmith shop, heard the blacksmith uh, using hammers of different proportions, and came up with certain intervals that would uh, then go on to become intervals in a, a so-called Western system of, of music, like the octave and the fifth and the fourth. It's nonsense, of course because the hammers wouldn't result in those intervals actually. It's been shown, it's been proven. Nevertheless, I'm just telling the, the, there might be listeners out there who don't understand uh, this particular mythology. Think here of the almost certainly false story of Pythagoras of the Black System, in which he divined through hammers proportionate weight the intervals of the octave, fifth, and fourth. We in music have created an entire mythology of Pythagoras and those hammers at the shop, and somehow it seems perfectly fine 
to treat this story as somehow authoritative, if not factual, and not mythological, which it almost certainly was. In other words, the white story of Pythagoras at the blacksmith shop has become history. This brings up the largest problem with Mary Lefkowitz's counterarguments. In a 2018 piece, Black Athena, White Power, Are We Paying the Price for Classics Response to Bernal? Classicist Denise Eileen McCoskey puts it better than I can. Leaving aside the personalities and general climates surrounding Black Athena, it is Lefkowitz's main premise regarding historical inquiry that I want to call out, since, since it is one too many classicists still endorse today, namely, that Afrocentrism pursued readings of the ancient world based in emotion, bias, and the need to build self-esteem, while classics, tightly wrapped in the mantle of objectivity, rigorously sought the truth. This spot-on criticism of Lefkowitz resonates deeply with me, since so many in conservative quarters of music theory, the vast majority of whom are in fact white men, have criticized my own Afrocentric work combining race scholarship with music theory as emotional and biased, while their own arguments are to be considered reasoned and objective. But this is one of the most effective tactics in the promotion of our white male frame, namely painting the person and questioning why the racialized and gendered structures of what we do exist as an emotional and unhinged critic. For my race scholarship in music, I have been called a charlatan, moron, dumbass, anti-Semite, and nitwit, among many other slurs on social media and in unsolicited communications. While those who defend the status quo are heroes of the natural order of things and of the truth. McCoskey continues, such a dichotomy that emotional people of color politicize history while reasonable white people seek objective fact was patently false in the 1980s, even as it became a staple in the arsenal of arguments defending the exclusionary practices of many disciplines. Needless to say, the notion that white people are somehow more conditioned for objectivity when it comes to historical thought is painfully false when set against the backdrop of white supremacy's renewed nostalgia for the classical world. Painfully false indeed. Is it any wonder that even today there are still those in music who would believe that white men are, some, are somehow more inclined toward a dubious objectivity while others toward a fraught emotionality? The white story of the Western canon in music. To see how Western mythologies played out in music, I'll turn to the most famous historical textbook, A History of Western Music by Donald Grout. I'll cite the 4th and 10th editions from 1988 and 2019, respectively. The 4th, which added the Yale University music theorist Claude Poliska, was very much like the previous three editions. Right off the bat, Grout and Poliska begin with the Roman Empire in the 5th century, highlighting the Christian era. Quote, The history of Western art music properly begins with the music of the Christian church. But all through the Middle Ages and even to the present time, artists and intellectuals have continually turned back to Greece and Rome for instruction, for correction, and for inspiration in their several fields of work. This has been true in music." Close quote. This doesn't appear anymore, of course. Right? This has been scrubbed, but this is what they were working with. With these words and this textbook, the origin myths of ancient Greece in music were solidified. Grout and Poliska explicitly tie Western art music to the Christian church, a church that obviously didn't exist in ancient Greece. Here the authors are splitting the difference. Western music began with the Christian church, but it also didn't because it began with ancient Greece. Of course, there were many musical traditions that predated those of the Christian church, or ancient Greece for that matter, but they have been erased from Western history. But Grout and Poliska were not at all exceptional in this erasure. It was, in fact, the story of mid-20th century America in all such historical accounts of music. Cutting to the 2019 10th edition, which added Indiana University musicologist Peter Burkholder, many changes are notable. There are more compositions from women and BIPOC, generally, and different genres, such as jazz and popular musics. Still, the outlines from Grout's original text are ever present in this newest edition, and the pitfalls still the same. I'm made uncomfortable by many parts of the long quotation on this slide. The notion of pitting the West against Asia as some kind of antipode to the total erasure of Africa and the pre-colonial Americas. 
The problematic belief that our philosophy is founded on Plato and Aristotle, or that our literature came only from Greek and Latin traditions, or that the West does not include Islam, which has been part of Europe since that religion's founding in the seventh century common era, to say nothing of other European non-Abrahamic religions. But most troubling to me is the incessant use of the first person plural pronouns, our and we. I myself was born in Long Beach, California to an African-American dad and a Norwegian mom. And I've lived for four years in Canada, seven in Russia, and the rest of my life in the United States. I could therefore reasonably be called a Westerner. I'm presenting in English, after all. Yet I see very little of myself in this long quotation. What about those tens of millions of US citizens and permanent residents whose connections to any alleged West are more distant than mine? And what about those millions of US citizens who were here long before Europeans began arriving roughly 500 years ago? Norwich, Vermont is located on the ancestral homeland of the Algonquin-speaking Abenaki peoples, part of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And throughout the horrors of colonization, these indigenous peoples remained here in Vermont and elsewhere. They are still here and they should be honored. I strongly doubt that they would see the our and the we in the long quotation on the slide. In hindsight, this quote uh, could have been set up with a simple clause. As whiteness and maleness have taught us over roughly, but not more than 150 years, the culture of Europe and the Americas etc. All of which is to say that the history of Western music is based on a lie. And that lie of a Western civilization going back to the ancient Greeks but not a day further is, for all intents and purposes, deeply rooted in white supremacy. Other academic fields have done a far better job than we have in academic music in interrogating their histories from a racial perspective. In American music theory and history, discussions about race have been systematically ignored or obscured, and it's high time we begin those discussions. For all its outstanding scholarship, what this newest version of a history of music, Western music does, as most such works do, is adapt Western mythologies to new 21st century realities on the ground. What this means is to engage in additive activities, which fall under the rubric of diversity, equity, and inclusivity, or DEI, adding women and BIPOC figures, for instance, other non-classical genres of American music, and still other global musics that become known as non-Western or world music, all while acknowledging the changing nature of the field. For example, at the end of the 10th edition, in a section entitled The Future of Western Music, Burkholder writes, the popularity of fusions, mashups, mixtures, and blends in recent years is only the latest manifestation of a long-standing trait in the Western tradition, combining multiple influences to create something new. True, Western music, such as it is, adapts, or I might add, conquers. But what it does not do, what it can never do, is reveal the truth about itself, namely, that there is no such thing as the West and there never has been. I'm gonna take a sip of water here, if you don't mind. Thanks for this very large bottle again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, you here in the audience or, or, or watching online may know something of a brouhaha from the summer of 2020 that involved me and a, and a publication of the Journal of Shankarian Studies. It made national and international news. I want to discuss a reaction to this particular volume, volume 12 of the Journal of Shankarian Studies. And I need a bit of context, so I'm gonna sum everything up on one slide if you don't know anything about this, and it's gonna be only 60 seconds because I just don't wanna waste a lot of time on this old story, so, so wish me luck. <clears throat> on 
November 9th, 2019, I gave a 20 minute plenary talk. Music theory's white racial frame at the annual meeting of the Society for Music Theory. I used language from sociologist Joe Fagan to point to the racial injustice in our field. Since I pointed out the racism of the music theorist Heinrich Schenker and linked it to racial injustice, the Journal of Schenkerian Studies decided to hurriedly publish a response symposium to my talk. Strangely, I was not invited to participate in any fashion, and the 15 published responses were not peer reviewed. Several of the responses contained anti black language. David Beach said that I should stop complaining about white guys, while Timothy Jackson wrote that blacks need to be raised up to standard in order to compete. Another response author, Alan Cadwallader, sent me a personal email calling me an inept idiot. In other words, Volume 12 was pieces. Many of came to my defense and condemned Volume 12, including SMT, Yale University, the University of Toronto, and the graduate students at UNT, where Volume 12 was published. An open letter was signed by more than 900 people, was addressed to SMT, urging anti-racist action. Then the media jumped in. Stories ran in Fox News, The New Yorker, The New York Times, Russian National TV, Und die Zeit, was natürlich super war. Dankeschön. <laughs> that was 60 seconds. A after my talk, I'll tell, I'll tell you anything you want to know. One thing. What, what was the name of the journal? What does it mean? Journal of Shankarian Studies, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about it afterwards. Yeah, I'll tell you about it after. Um, I will now briefly discuss one reaction to the JSS affair, JSS being Journal of Shankarian Studies, affair that demonstrates some of the white stories that get put forth as histories when racism happens. This reaction, this European white story, came from a European open letter, which proves that the racism that was contained in volume 12, and therefore in American music theory, is not limited to the United States. One thing that I've emphasized overall with my race scholarship in music is that white supremacy was and is very much a worldwide project, and that it originated in Europe, not here in the United States. Happily, <coughs> this letter was signed by only 47 signatories who wrote, for example, there are the signatories, uh, who wrote, for example, we were unable to identify any anti-black statement nor any attack against Philip Ewell, the man, which is the meaning of ad hominem in this JSS volume. Setting aside the remarkable condescension of explaining what ad hominem means, their inability to see any racism or anti-blackness in the journal issue speaks to a common white perspective on or white story about racism exactly the same white perspective that comedian W. Kamau Bell talked about in his stand-up routine at the beginning of my talk today. Though they saw no attack against me in Volume 12, the Europeans characterized my plenary as an attack against Schenker, which is another common white perspective if non-whiteness points out structural racism. To be clear, my talk was not an attack, but a challenge to music theory to think about race and confront racism in the field. The European authors characterized the entire affair as a dispute between me and Timothy Jackson, the main author of the volume issue. To state the obvious, there has never been a dispute or a debate between me and Timothy Jackson and the other, author, and the other authors in that volume. Calling my talk an attack and then framing the ensuing issues as a debate is an obfuscating tactic in white racial framing. In this case, to turn the anti-black racism of volume 12 into a legitimate form of self-defense. Or as Kimberly Crenshaw puts it, the hysteria about this putatively un-American inquiry is possible in part because Americans are not often taught about the policies and practices through which races, racism has shaped our nation. Nor do we typically teach that racist aggression against reform has been repeatedly legitimized as self-defense, an embodiment of an enduring claim that anti-racism is racism against white people. The essence of volume 12 of the Journal of Shankarian Studies was racist aggression against reform that was, in the European Open Letter, the New York Times, and countless other conservative media outlets, repeatedly legitimized as self-defense. Once we accept that simple truth and allow it to sink in, the reimagining, restructuring, the healing can begin. And here I would just point out another um, piece in the New York Times that was essentially a hit piece on me and my recent book. This was written by John McWhorty. You can see his little photo down there. It was called, Is Musicology Racist? It came out in May in the New York Times. It was not, nothing other than a hit piece on uh, me and this book. 
uh, to which I say thank you uh, because it made me a lot of money. <laughs> um, and it's really important, a few, a few things to point out here. Um, you can see that John McWhorter is a black man, and I would like to point out that anti-black blacks are extremely useful to white supremacy. Think here Clarence Thomas. That's the, the, the most basic example, but there's a long, long history of, of, of that. Uh, similarly, anti-woman women are extremely useful to patriarchy. I don't need to tell you all that. I'm sure you know that. And we could just go down the list. Anti-Jewish Jews are extremely useful to anti-Semitism, right? Anti-Asian Asians, et cetera, et cetera. And I think you all know why that is. Well, John McWhorter is an anti-black black. black. Um, and there you have it. Uh, and my advice uh, when, when, uh, when you get some kind of, when, when people bait you into these things, as he was baiting me and others, I say don't engage with the context of this kind of bad faith nonsense. In other words, don't take part in your own dehumanization. That's very important. I teach that to all my students or advisees. And finally, uh, instead, just thank those who offer such nonsense for their help in making your arguments. I th thanked him on Twitter for making me money, but, also, but more important than making me money is he's ma helping me make my arguments. Because if you actually read this drivel, um, sure, it might excite you know, Tucker Carlson's out there, they, you know, the kind of extreme right. Fine, I'm not speaking, they're not my constituency. I don't really care what Tucker Carlson thinks about Philip Ewell. My constituency are musicians, music educators, uh, students, and when they read it, I mean, he's just not a musician. He really doesn't understand. He tries to say he's a musician, but he's not. He's a linguist, actually. Um, and uh, it, it's actually quite easy to see the nonsense, and it's just very helpful in making my points. So um, thanks for that, I, I would say, to a person like John McWhorter. OK, let's move on. And now I'm going to talk about uh, desegregating the music curriculum. Why jazz is not part of the typical music theory curriculum? On its face, jazz represents the perfect genre for music theory. It has all the traits, melody, harmony, linear progressions, rich scales and modes, intricate <coughs> rhythms, complicated chord progressions, and formal complexity commonly associated with our field. Jazz spans the tonal and atonal idioms and has a time-honored and well-developed theoretical tradition stretching back to the early 20th century. Jazz's worldwide impact is not in dispute, and many consider jazz to be, historically, America's most important music. Yet for all intents and purposes, jazz remains at the fringe of American music theory, most prominently in our undergraduate music theory core curriculum. Sure, there are jazz programs it, at most US music institutions now, but they are still quite outside the generic undergraduate music major, an add-on to what is considered the essential knowledge of academic music, the quote-unquote supreme geniuses of a so-called Western canon. The best way to show why jazz is not part of basic music curricula is through an analogy, this time to US healthcare. In her piece for Nicole Hannah-Jones' 1619 project, New York Times staff writer Janine Interlandi unpacks the history of U.S. healthcare from a racial perspective. She speaks of how, in the late 1940s, President Harry Truman made a hard push for a national universal single-payer healthcare system in the United States, which initially had widespread public support and congressional support as well. The reason it ultimately failed was that the American Medical Association, which was an all-white male organization at the time, lobbied hard against it, claiming that government should stay out of healthcare. Interlandi speaks of how the AMA characterized national health care as socialized medicine, told of how it would destroy the doctor-patient relationship, and called Harry Truman a communist. Fun fact, Harry Truman in the late 1920s was a member of the Ku Klux Klan for a small period of time. Hardly a communist organization, I would say. The AMA supported racially segregated hospitals in which there were white floors and black floors, the black floors usually being in the basements, and they were able to keep hospitals racially segregate, segregated by torpedoing Truman's national health care system. 
All the same arguments played out in the battle for Medicare in the 1960s, but a significant black doctor, Montague Cobb, successfully counter-lobbied the AMA, and U.S. President Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare into law in 1965. One would have thought that, when the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964, American hospitals would have racially desegregated, since that was a key component of the Civil Rights Act, and that there would no longer be, be white floors and black floors, but that didn't happen. Medicare changed that in 1965, since millions and millions of federal dollars were available to hospitals that desegregated. The speed with which hospitals desegregated after Medicare passed was astonishing. Quote, Interlanti, Interlanti says, and so Medicare passes, and what happens is within four months of implementation, nearly 3,000 hospitals desegregate. And now for my analogy to jazz. From its beginnings, jazz has been deeply associated with African Americanism, and as such, has been segregated out of music studies. In fact, this is the reason why all non-white musics have been segregated out of American music studies, but I digress. The reason why jazz was never integrated, the reason why American music studies and especially American music theory never truly desegregated to become more than just white, and just male, by the way, is simple. We in, academic, in the academic study of music never had millions of federal dollars dangled in front of us saying, if you desegregate your music curriculum, you can have this money. But if you don't, you can't. It is a virtual impossibility that the racial views of the white male musicological doctors who created US music institutions were significantly different from the racial views of the white male medical doctors who created US healthcare institutions. In music, we've never had a moment of racial reckoning, a moment whereby we were forced to face our segregationist past, such as US hospitals faced in the 1960s. Sure, everyone knows that racial disparities in healthcare are still rampant in the United States today, but we also know that there are no longer any black floors or white floors in our hospitals. Sadly, American music theory and music studies still reside entirely for all intents and purposes on the white floors of our music institutions, while jazz and all other non-white musics are relegated to non-white floors. Our American music curricula are still racially segregated. <clears throat> Many jazz artists contributed to concert music, interacted with European methods, and produced music theoretical work. Artists such as Muhal Richard Abrams, Jerry Allen, Anthony Braxton, Stanley Jordan, Yusuf Latif, Wadada Leo Smith, Roland Wiggins, Mary Lou Williams, and Ollie Wilson. It would make perfect sense to feature such artists in our undergraduate music theory classes and to teach their music theories as part of our own tonal and atonal traditions. George Russell's <coughs> Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization is one of the most significant theories of tonal harmony to ever be published in the United States, and is ripe for exploration in its own right, within and not outside of American music theory. At once a practical manual, theoretical treatise on tonality, exercise book, historical narrative, discography, and improvisation workbook, the Lydian chromatic concept represents a fascinating account of mid-20th century practices in jazz and in tonality. Russell's historical perspective, quote unquote, outlines the history of the modes and touches on such figure, figures as Huckbald, Heinrich Glarion, Giuseppe Zarlino, Palestrina, and Claudio Monteverdi. Uh, these are all very famous music theorists in the Western narrative of music. Uh, Russell discusses Pythagorean tuning and other tuning systems to contextualize the equal temperament of his Lydian chromatic concept. In the final edition of this work from 2001, Russell includes examples by Johann Sebastian Bach, Claude Debussy, and Maurice Ravel to show the applicability of his theory of tonality to classical music. With respect to engaging with Russell's Lydian chromatic concept, let me be clear. I am not suggesting that, by citing European authors and composers, Russell's book is somehow legitimized and therefore worthy of consideration. His book does not need legitimization. The only reason it has been widely discounted by American music theory is because Russell was black. A mixed-race black, in fact, 
with a white father and a black mother. Rather, I'm suggesting that this work could easily be integrated into our music theory curriculum at all levels, since Russell gives compelling American insights into tonal music. I think that the current integration of our music curricula from a class in music fundamentals to doctoral comprehensive exams with other non-white musics is one of the most necessary and exhilarating moments in American music's history. Knowing of the exclusionary nature of the racialized structures of music and how unjust those structures are, we must all come together to dismantle them and forge new paths for the future. I'm always struck by how we in the States can think of European music as intimately ours, but our own American music as foreign. A violinist in East Tennessee can learn all the intricacies of Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto, written over 150 years ago, some 5,000 miles away, but never dare play that same violin in an Appalachian fiddling style, which happens right now in their own backyard. Our promotion of music's European quote-unquote supreme geniuses at the expense of so many American genres, and not just jazz and bluegrass, of course, has greatly impoverished our American music institutions. We can enrich them all by understanding not only that many American and other global musics deserve our attention, but also that the European quote-unquote masters were actually just composers like all others composers who wrote interesting music, also deserving of attention, but not inherently better than other musics of our planet. This point is ultimately much larger than just music theory, which is my field. The missions of our music schools, departments, and conservatories were conceived decades ago, if not more than a century ago. And the hierarchical legacy of privileging European music over our own is still very much alive and well in the United States. This is something we must all confront as we forge new paths in the 21st century. <clears throat> Desegregating our music curricula does, to one extent or another, entail finding music that was shunted to the side by our white male structures, and, mo and most American music institutions are engaging in this additive activity, which, as I, said uh, as I said before, falls under the rubric of diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Find a piece by Florence Price, research and rehearse it, put it onto a program, and repeat that cycle. The harder part of desegregation is the anti-racist work that can explain why a composer like Price was never considered worthy of attention in the first place. Here are a few examples of uh, what, what I uh, will we'll talk about, the, what I call the difference between DEI and anti-racism. Now, of course, you all know that both of these things are under fire in our country. People are banning DEI stuff uh, as if to say diversity is, is bad now. And people are, are challenging and saying that I don't like, I'm anti-anti-racist. Well, I'm like, I hate to tell you, but I know how double negatives work. And if you are against anti-racism, I'll let you fill in the blanks there. But that's essentially what a lot of people are saying, and it's, it's very sad. Nevertheless, uh, this too shall pass, and uh, we will get back to acknowledging the fact that our country is a multiracial democracy, um, even, even though some people might not like that fact. Um, and we will be talking about these things here. And I wish now to draw a distinction between DEI activities and anti-racist or anti-sexist activities. So for example, a DEI activity might be staging Shirley Graham Du Bois's opera Tom Tom, an epic of music in the Negro. She was W.E.B. Du Bois's second wife, and uh, he was her second husband, actually. Uh, that's a DEI um, activity. The anti-racist version might be writing an academic work explaining why Tom Tom has been ignored because of structural racism and sexism. Uh, she was, of course, a black woman. Number two, a DEI activity might be forming a committee to discuss various aspects of race and gender in a music curriculum, the anti-racist version, voting in committee to discontinue a racist, sexist, exclusionist structure, like a graduate German language requirement. You might not know that music graduate students generally are forced to study German language to this day. Um, I, though I'm, I'm having a lot of success, I have to say, in changing that. People are dropping those requirements. They might not want to mention my name, but uh, 
very, you're welcome, <laughs> I'll, I'll simply say. Uh, number three, allowing a student to pass a musicianship proficiency by substituting, say, the oud for the piano as an exception to a piano proficiency, proficiency requirement. An oud is an, an Arabic, uh, many thousands of years old. It's like a lute, basically. It's a guitar-type instrument, but a bigger body. It's a precursor to the lute, which is a European version of an oud. Uh, the anti-racist version, discontinuing the piano proficiency requirement altogether, having realized that it itself is a method of policing and enforcing a commitment to whiteness and maleness. Of course, all of the quote unquote great masters of a European canon, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, Chopin, etc. Yes, they were all white men, but they, all were, they were also all pianists. Uh, and by the way, they all spoke German with just maybe one, one exception. I mean, uh, Chopin, of course, was a Pole who lived in France for most of his life, although he probably knew German too, he, Polish and French for sure. Um, but all, all of the rest of these, again, quote unquote, great masters were in fact German speakers. Uh, number four, adding a Jewish or a Kwanzaa song to your winter holiday concert. The anti-racist version of that? Examining the legacy of Christianity associated with such concerts and the potentially exclusionary aspects of a hidden Christianity requirement therein. And finally, a DEI activity might be admitting a woman a transgender man or woman, or gender nonconforming person into your doctoral orchestral conducting program. It of course doesn't surprise the listener to know that orchestral conductors are 98% male and of those 95% are white. It's a radically exclusionist uh, musical world. Uh, so this might be the DEI version. My anti-racist version would be committing in writing to have minimum 50% such persons within a given time frame, say five years in your doctoral orchestral conducting program at all levels from incoming students to senior faculty. Finally, I mean to say here that this can be good, but it is sometimes not. Staging Shirley Graham's opera would certainly be a good thing. Forming a committee? Usually not. It's usually a smokescreen. For committee formation, we all know it, we've all seen it. It's a way to pass the buck, kick the can down the road, use whatever metaphor you want. It's a way to take inaction rather than action, right? Anti-racism is, of course, better, and I would tell the listener, I would warn the listener, beware, because that's when the knives come out. Just Google Philip Ewell and Fox News, for example. And, uh, or Breitbart, or Quillette, or The Spectator, or a lot of uh, conservative outlets that have trashed me. I don't read the stuff there. Um, I simply thank them for, <laughs> for, for making me for more famous. You know, what can I say? <laughs> They're doing a very good job. Um, I often say to my faculty colleagues that you actually only need two things to do this hard stuff if you are a faculty at a college or university. One, you're going to need tenure. You can't do it pre-tenure. And number two, you're going to need a really good high-speed internet connection, which, by the way, where I live in Brooklyn, is harder to get than tenure. <laughs> Spectrum is very bad. Let's just uh, leave it at that. On the right side, um, you can see that this is more uh, uh, kind of, well, I don't want to say confrontational. I don't like that word necessarily, but it's bolder, right, the, uh, the action on the right. And, uh, and you, one must be prepared if one wants to take bold action. Uh, I liked, if you haven't noticed, I very much like citing white race scholars because it shows the listener, I already know this, uh, because I have a white mother who was a great anti-racist. Uh, my parents, my black father, white mother, right? I'm, I'm a mixed race guy. Um, and she passed in 2010. Um, but I like to let my listeners know that this is the case here. And, and here I have a, a great example from a, a German theologian who wrote a, a groundbreaking book called Moral Man and Immoral Society, a study in ethics and politics from 1932. And Reinhold Niebuhr writes, however large the number of individual white men who do and who will identify themselves completely with the Negro cause, the white race in America will not admit the Negro to equal rights if it is not forced to do so. Upon that point, one may speak with a dogmatism, which all history justifies. Bravo, hear, hear. Um, I, uh, uh, he was a, a great American and a personal friend of Martin Luther King, by the way. OK, <clears throat> let me come back here to my script. Not too much more. 
My final black historical point for today concerns the Peabody Institute of Music, one of the finest in the States. In a message of inclusion, a history of exclusion, racial injustice at the Peabody Institute, a 2019 master's thesis for Peabody, violinist Sarah Thomas tells the history of racial exclusionism at Peabody from a black perspective, a final black history for today. It took Peabody nearly a century after its founding in 1857 to admit its first black student, Paul Brent, in 1949, and there was great controversy surrounding his admittance. Though racial exclusion was rarely written into school charters, it was generally accepted in segregated American institution, educational institutions. Responding to Brett's application to Peabody, its president, William Marbury, wrote to the board of directors in July 1949, quote, we are brought face to face with the issue whether to modify our long-standing rule against the admission of Negro students, unquote. Thus putting in writing that which was only unofficial policy at the time. Once the issue was put to a vote, only one board member, Douglas Gordon, openly opposed admitting Brent. In his letter to President Marbury about admitting Brent, Gordon wrote, it seems to me that it would be a great mistake to change the present policy. In our climate, the presence of Negroes can to some be extremely offensive. Notwithstanding this, to others, their presence together with whites at school, etc., is, as in the South, going to lead to such a mixed race as, as one can see in Sicily or Brazil. Not a very, very edifying spectacle. The illegibility is because Sarah was uh, taking a transcription of a written uh, note or postcard uh, that, that this had been written on. The presence of Negroes, the very presence of Negroes, can to some be extremely offensive. This is surely an abhorrent view, and today one might like to think that such views were, in fact, exceptional among whites in the early to mid 20th century. Unfortunately, this is simply not true. For example, about the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, Linda Gordon writes, most important, the 1920s, sorry, the 1920s Klan program was embraced by millions who were not members, possibly even a majority of Americans. Far from appearing disreputable or extreme in its ideology, the 1920s Klan seemed ordinary and respectable to its contemporaries. No. Such abhorrent views about blacks among whites in the early to mid 20th century were not at all exceptional. More likely, they were, in fact, the norm. On the point of admitting Paul Brent to Peabody, there was, uh, there was great hesitancy among the other board members, as evidenced by another response to President Marbury, this one from board member J. Hall Pleasance. I vote reluctantly to admit Brent as a student, adding, I feel that there is an historical uh, 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 an hysterical element in the way the Negro question, especially in its racial aspects, is being rushed at the present time, and that under the guise of racial equality, things are going too fast. Slowing down racial progress is a common trope among white persons in the history of the United States, a slowing down often referred to as incrementalism or gradualism. Finally, the board members expressed that they could only admit Brent as an exception to their unwritten rule against admitting black students, rather than openly getting rid of racial barriers. And he would only be so admitted if he were deemed, quote, extremely talented, unquote, at his audition, which meant that a higher bar for admittance was being established for Brent as a black applicant. We blacks often say that we have to be twice as good as our white counterparts in order to get half the credit. I feel that often white persons either reject this view outright or have trouble understanding it. With the case of Paul Brent, we have proof that he was being held to a higher standard than the typical white applicant to Peabody. Sadly, being held to a higher standard still applies to many BIPOC women and other minoritized groups in any number of arenas in the United States. A final point about this telling story, this black history. I imagine that when I said that Sarah Thomas told this story from a black perspective, that you may have thought that Sarah Thomas is, in fact, black. But she's not. Sarah Thomas is white. And like so many white race scholars before her, 
Sarah is doing true anti-racist work, precisely the type of, of work needed in order to truly desegregate our music curricula. Indeed, some of my favorite race scholars have been white, like Kathleen Ballou, on the paramilitary aspects of white supremacy, Ari Berman on vote voting rights, Jane Daly on the sexual panic of white supremacy, Jonathan Metzl on dying of whiteness, Jesse Daniels on cyber racism and her most recent book is Nice White Ladies. She's a former mentor of mine. Or Joe Fagan on white racial framing. Joe and I are now co-editing uh, uh, a volume for Rutledge called American Anti-Blackness. <clears throat> Finally, I've called out whiteness and maleness as structures today, which they have historically and undoubtedly been in our country. But I really must separate white male persons from those structures. Some of the best allies I've ever had in my career have been, have in fact been white men. And as I've delved deeper and deeper into race scholarship, I've been honored and humbled at the countless white men who have contacted me to have deep discussions about American music's racial past and how we can move forward together in a positive fashion. And on a personal note, as a mixed race black guy myself, I can say with certainty that my Norwegian mother was a far better anti-racist than my African-American father. And it was, in fact, my white mom who taught me the true meaning. I'm choking up here. The true meaning of anti-racism long before that term entered my vocabulary. I began my talk with a quote from a great American, <clears throat> Kimberly Crenshaw, and now I'll end with one from another great American, Martin Luther King. My father graduated with Martin Luther King, if you can believe it, from Morehouse College in 1948. This is from his famous I Have a Dream speech from 1963. Martin Luther King said, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thanks to everybody out there, too. You had a question, I think. I did, but I have another question. Though. By all means, I go ahead. Please, please. Can you teach a um, music history class that <coughs> could be lost? Do I teach? or do, I, uh, do, you, do you teach one that like, is new? Or not um, or no, the short answer is no. The short answer is no, yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm teaching two classes right now. They're just finishing up, and one is historical. It's called Black Music in the Americas, uh, which is a lot of fun. And then I'm teaching a music theory class. Uh, generally, our hunter classes are not offered by Zoom. No, no, it well, won't. Oh yeah, it's you know, on the bomb, but, I mean, that's, I would, it's changing would radically. Yeah. Every day it's changing. I've uh, I was at a conference in Denver, and uh, three people gave a great presentation about how the New York University uh, curriculum is changing. Um, I, 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 it would be hard to name a, a college or university or even conservatory, and those are places that are more conservative, right? Juilliard, New England Conservatory. Nobody is, is just letting everything stay. Nobody. It's, it's impossible. You just can't. You just can't do it anymore and tell the, the whole world that the only composers you have to think about are 20, roughly. I, I usually say about 20 uh, European, but they're, not, but they're not European. They were from Vienna. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, you, Europe is a little bit bigger than Vienna, actually, quite. Maybe from Paris, maybe from Berlin. If you go back far enough, a couple of them were from Venice, for example. 
Um, but it's extratically exclusionary. The music that we had been taught when I was taught in the 80s and 90s, all the music that matters, I often say it represents maybe not even 0.1% of the world's music. And it took up 100% of the territory for our musical institutions. And now everyone's like, okay, that's over, it's done. A lot of people are upset. They're upset with people like me. Fine, I, I can take the heat. Um, but it's changing, and, and it's change, it, how is it changing? It's a very difficult question. I, it's, we can't say, I don't know. All I know is that things are changing. Everybody's rethinking how they teach music, and it's an exciting time to be, to be part of it, actually. Anybody else? So, so I went to Oberlin with the conservatory, and I was thinking... Were you a conservatory or no, a college? No, I, I was in the college, but because they were, you know, obviously very serious students. Mm -hmm. But I was sitting here thinking about sort of the changes that I read about in alumni magazines. But, you know, like, there's the changes, and then there's the changes. Absolutely, right? yeah. And, and so if you're saying that it seems like changes are being made, but it feels like it's like one of those very slow drip, 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 Maybe generationally, mm -hmm. you know. You, you, I always assume, like, you know, people are always like, "Oh, just let this generation die out." <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah. I don't know. I feel like you kind of still have to move forward and do the work. And I deeply appreciated the DEI versus anti-racism mm. because that is such a clear thing of like, yeah, you can do this, but this is really this That's is right. to try to dismantle yeah. what has been set into place through white supremacy. Yeah, you know? and that's. But you are hearing that, mm -hmm. or your Well, yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, it's it's a difficult. Uh, th I so I gave a talk in Oberlin um, in April, and I know I know all of the music theory faculty there. Maybe ten people. Yeah. I have a couple of very good friends, and I know you know many of the mu mu uh, musicologists. Um, music theory just did a huge rewrite for their music theory curriculum, and it's now in their second year of doing it, and they say it's going well. Um, but uh, you know how much you retain from the way music was taught versus how much is new, all of the new materials you have to write. You have to cull these scores. Sometimes they're handwritten. You need to typeset them, copyright them. It's a very long process. But beyond the difficult work of, of figuring out what music we are actually going to teach and how, beyond that, there's a more difficult thing uh, to, 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 to talk about. And that's, if you look at all people with tenure in, in music institutions, uh, and, and the conservatories, they don't really have tenure, but just the, you know, the senior people. Um, and if you, uh, let me try to put them into three groups. The reason I'm talking about people with tenure, because those are the only people who can actually make the changes. If you don't have tenure, you can't. You might be able to raise your hand and vote at a meeting once or twice, but then you're told you shouldn't have done that later, and then you have to worry about your job, right? So if you have tenure, you have power, and that is extremely important. So all of the tenured music faculty in the country, I'll put them into three camps. There's a, a solid camp, uh, I don't want to put a number on it, but just like a big chunk that are genuinely uh, for change, and they want to see the change, uh, a, a sizable segment. There's a small segment, and I will put a number here, let's say not more than 10%, who are vocally saying over our dead bodies, Philip Ewell is a jerk, all of this stuff is nonsense, Schubert was the greatest composer I lived in. I mean, it's just hard for them to be so vocal, so I, not, but still they're, they're there, they're there, and um, it's not more than 10%. Everybody in between, that's the, that's the soft spot, and that's where the problems are. That's the people that Martin Luther King, as he wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963, those are the people he called the white moderate. And he very famously said, you know, I don't have a problem with the, the KKK. They hate me, I hate them, and, and that's that. I'm okay with that. You know, I don't want to talk to them, and they don't want to talk to me. It's the, he said, white moderate, that was his term. And I would essentially say that there are, there's a, a, a very large segment of people with power, tenure, who, uh, and, and in, my, in my field, that you, if you have tenure, you are almost a priori white. It's over 90%. In, in music theory, it's about 94% tenure people are white. Musicology, 90, also about 94, I would say. And they, 
they, they're going to say that they want change. They're going to say BLM out of this side of their mouth, but then they're going to say we have to stop this. And they don't have the courage, I'll just be blunt, to look at themselves in the mirror and acknowledge that some of what they believe, some of the basic elements of what they think about music actually align to an extent with white supremacy and patriarchy. It's just really hard. And I get that. I, I, it's not like I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not naming any names here. I'm just saying that there is a large segment of, of people, because I know these are people I, I've, I've known for, for many years. And I can see it. I understand it. And they just can't. They don't have the courage. And it's that lack of courage, I have to say, that is, it's because I'm like, you have tenure. Right. If not mean? now, when? Right, exactly. If not now, when? Oh, are you scared because your governor is going to do something? And oh, that big guy who plays all 32 Beethoven sonatas, and you know, he's a really strong man. And, and I'll, I don't care. You've got tenure. <laughs> Screw this guy. He pays 32 Beethoven sonatas. I play the five cello sonatas. That doesn't make me cooler than anyone else. It just means I play the cello sonatas. And they're beautiful pieces of music, as are the 32 piano sonatas. I just see people being cowed into a corner, and I just, I. I don't want to. I don't want to sound too harsh here because it's difficult. I, I get it. It's hard. It's not easy to, to take on power structures. But but tenure is there to take on power structures if you see injustice happening, and there is tremendous amount of musical injustice to this day in in the United States. There, there just is. So so I don't have the answer of how to deal right there with that. Maybe Jacob, and then, then we come back here. Yeah. Um, so I have kind of a. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that that's very much a mentor mentee relationship. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, are there any challenges with kind of implementing that teaching or teaching of that type of theory in a classroom setting? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's a big issue, actually, because so many very rich musical traditions, like in the Indian subcontinent, many parts of Africa, uh, the Middle East, where they play the oud, they have makams and these extremely intricate, you know, centuries and yes, millennia old musical traditions. Many of them are just not notated uh, in the same way as a five-line staff of music with little note heads on it, right? Chopin, Beethoven, Mozart, and in fact, a lot of people they they say this is proof that this system is superior, and you're just like, what? I mean, it just it doesn't really make any sense. Listen to the music, right? And, and then, and, and yeah, if you really love Beethoven's Night Symphony, that's great. But there's a great Indian piece that you haven't heard, and, and maybe you'll love that too. I happen to really like that, that music. Uh, implementing that in a, in a music uh, education is very difficult. Of course, you need to have the, the personnel. You need to have resources and money. You need to get instruments together. But then if you're going to be in the classroom, and I know this because of the, the, the undergraduate textbook that I'm co-authoring, one of our editorial board members is a Hindustani dancer. She's brilliant, uh, ethnomusicologist. She's at Yale now, a friend of mine. And um, you know, she is helping us find the language to put it into a music theory textbook uh, in terms of the rhythmic cycles. That's what we're dealing with now. And, and there are ways, but sometimes you're, you're notating something that was not meant to be notated. And that's a very big issue. With people talk about that a lot in music studies. So there are certain musics that won't be represented. A lot of indigenous musics in our country don't, it's not that they, they, they're they unnotated often, but oftentimes they're like, no, we don't want it to be notated. That's not the point. And you got to respect that. You're like, okay, okay, that's cool. Um, the Hindustani example, uh, they're like, no, no, well, this is cool. People have notated some of the stuff that we do, and we're okay with that. Let's put it out there. and show, Because then the students are going to hit play, and they're going to watch either me or herself dance, or or a, an ensemble playing tabla and, and you know a sitar, or whatever. And the students are going to be like, "This is amazing! Thank you." Now I'm going to take my violin and go and find somebody like that, and we're going to play it together. And all of a sudden, you're like, "Great! You're making music together." You, know? you can still play your Mozart if, if, if that's you know what's going to you know get you out of bed in the morning. But but there's a lot of new stuff happening. It's very. That's a great question though, Jacob. And it's hard hard to answer. Do you have something else? You, you mentioned your mom was a big influence, and I wonder oh. what was your turning point as a child and then as a scholar? Was, was like when I <clears throat> when I decided I might become a scholar, going like growing up, or I'm, I'm curious to know what what a couple of the pivotal events in your life was such that you pursued uh, musicology and, mm -hmm. and 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, there. There's there. There are some difficult things in there. I won't get too deep into it. But you know, look, parents are parents, and there's going to be difficult things. I have a 14 year old, and I, there it is. And it's <laughs> so far so good, basically. But he's right at the point. He's kind of. <laughs> He's about pivoting to like you know. Fourteen's not much. You like you can leave now, Dad. Yeah. Um, but for me, um, you know, my dad was a huge influence growing up. He was very into classical music. He was one of those button-down uh, black intellectuals. PhD in mathematics from UCLA, became a professor. Maybe I was thinking I would become a scholar because my dad was a, a math scholar, right? Um, and I just kind of put, they kind of put it in my in, in the back of my head. Uh, he also was a big influence in me starting the cello when I was nine years old. You know, he bought me a cello. He was very excited about. It. He wanted me to pursue music. He also would have been happy if I'd done math and 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 physics. And that's what I was going to do as an undergrad. I was math was always super easy for me. I was always really good at it. And I was going to do some engineering, physics, mathematics, whatever. Um, and I almost did not even take my cello to college, but I was like, ah, hell, whatever. And I took it, and then I just went that different route. Um, and my mom, on the other hand, um, you know, she and I had problems, more problems growing up. I'll be blunt. Um, this was DeKalb, Illinois, and DeKalb was a sunset town, right? You know, black people had to leave before sunset, right? Mm -hmm. Until the late 60s. And we were there in maybe 74. Um, it was well, way over 90% white, probably 95% white. And it was rough. It was just hard. It, they were. It was a. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, it would be so much easier if my mom were just black, because I present as black, my dad's black, and it, it would have simplified things. And I remember, on and this, I'm, I'm ashamed of this. And my mom and I later talked about this that I was uh, trying not to be seen with her as much as possible. And that was just my child brain trying to make life easier in, in a very. Uh, it was a virulently racist kind of growing up, right? Um, happily, you know, um, that, uh, that went through high school, but then, you know, already by the time I was a, a freshman in college, I began to learn uh, with some really good friends who were just like, oh, that's really cool. That's a really cool thing that your mom's white and from Norway. Man, that's, uh, I think I know where that is. And um, of course, I had been to Norway a couple of times by that point. And um, happily, you know, I realized just how how big a, an impact my mom actually had on me back when she was alive and we could talk about those. It wasn't one of those things that I've regretted because she passed. I was able to fix it, so to speak, and apologize and have, have adult conversations with her. Um, I don't know if that answered your, your question, but uh, you know, those were the influences uh, growing up. My mom was also very supportive of music and scholarship, though she would have been happy if I'd done anything. <laughs> My dad was, you know, you have to be like the next Mozart, um, or anything less than that would be, you know, would be a failure. Um, I mean, my dad, to finish the point, uh, two things. He, he was completely sold on the white racial frame. I mean, he, he believed that Beethoven was the best. He was one of those mid 20th century black people who bought into it, like W.E.B. Du Bois. I mean, you know, he, he went to Germany and to Bayreuth and loved Wagner and very famously. Um, were my dad alive today and he died in 2007, number one, he would disagree with me. He would say, no, because whiteness teaches us you're not supposed to talk about race. You're supposed to get rid of that and just talk about greatness and exceptionalism. And my dad would say, no, Beethoven was just exceptional. It doesn't matter what his race was because that's what you're supposed to do, right? That's that's. Um, but number two, I would say this about my dad. He would look at me and just the impact that I think I've had on, at the expense of sounding modest maybe, on music and music education in the country, and he'd, he'd say, good for you. You are not messing around. Mm -hmm. And you have had an impact. So I, would have, I, I, I know that he would have been happy about that, even though it might result in less Beethoven at the concert, <laughs> which, which he would have really lamented. I'll, I gotta be honest. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Dad. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Please, by all means, yeah, yes. So, um, I love going to the live stream of Matt. Of the oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, I was just there last week. Yeah. Right, okay. So, they're really working on diversity. Finally, they are, yeah. yeah. So, do you, what's, what's, do you consider that to be outreach? 
DEI. Or anti racism. Well, you know, the Met, <sighs> they're finally <laughs> figuring out. That I, but, you know, it's kicking and screaming. I, that, I would consider DEI, basically, right? They're just adding uh, operas. So this last one I saw was Florencia de, de la Amarone. It's brilliant. I, I really like this. Mexican composer Daniel Catan. Um, the opera was written in 1996, and it's a brilliant. It's the only. Th it's only the third Spanish language opera that the Met has staged, and the Met started in 1883. And um, they finally found out that black people actually wrote operas too. And Terence Blanchard has had two operas. I've seen them both, and Anthony Davis has had one. And um, and that's great, but it's like. They're they're still alive. Uh, um, I I've been I've uh, delved deeply into this composer John Thomas Douglas, who was born of a slave mother in 1847, and he ended up studying violin and composition in Dresden, Germany, and then in Paris, and then he was back in New York. He taught David Manis violin, and David Manis was a very famous New York violinist. Um, he taught him in the 1860s, and John Thomas Douglas wrote an opera called Virginia's Ball. So big dance for Virginia's Ball and, and staged it in New York City in 1868. So that's probably the first opera written by an African American, but you never know um, until maybe someone else finds something else out there. Uh, so, you know, I would want to say if I could ever meet Peter Galvin, I'm sure I never will. He's the head of the Met, right? Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, why not stage Scott Joplin's Tree Manisha in 1911? That's easy. Right? Why not stage one of Harry Lawrence Freeman's 22 operas, the first of which was staged in 1891 in Denver, actually. It's called Epithalia. Why not stage Shirley Graham Du Bois? Uh, why not stage uh, Zenobia Powell Perry, uh, Tawawa House? I mean, I, the, the list is very long. There are many, many operas written by black people, and then there are many operas written by other non-white non-men, right? Uh, women, as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew, right? <laughs> Wrote operas. And, you know, it's, it's, in, it's incredible, really, because it's so unjust. And it's, well, that's just that's what patriarchy and that's what white supremacy. I mean, if y y you can only program as they have in the Met or in any opera company, now let's not focus only on the Metropolitan Opera, which is 99 plus percent operas written by white men. You can only do that. You have to believe in two things very deeply white supremacy and patriarchy, because you have to believe that all the best operas were written by <gasps> Mozart, Puccini, Wagner, Bellini, Donizetti, should I keep going? I mean, Verdi, obviously. Um, and, and then if you believe that, well, then fine, keep going and do La Boheme. It's in a new staging. Well, of course it's in a new staging. It's been, it was written 120 years ago. Come on, what? You can't go the same staging. I mean, I could. I, go ahead, yeah. But you should call me Phil. Okay, yeah. Phil. Yes. So why don't you write a letter to Mr. Jones and... Oh, yeah. Uh-oh. Well, actually, they're, 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 not doing, they're not doing horribly right now uh, in the sense that they're, they have this Mexican composer. They have had two black composers. They've uh, Kaya Sariajo, the Finnish woman, she just died uh, six months ago. Uh, they staged her opera. They're finally figuring out. I mean, they, it, it's business ultimately. Like, you know, they kept saying they kept saying two things at the Met. We need to change something because if you just look at the audience, it's graying. They said it's graying, and there are a lot of empty seats, and we need the money for the ticket sales, right? We need to change something in our in our business plan, right? Because it's they're just not coming in the same numbers for the next uh, Tannhäuser or you know Wagner this Verdi that. And then at the same time, you're like, well, why don't you try to do some new operas written by people who were maybe not both white and male, or 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 white male who've just written an opera that just got written off because it's whatever reason, because the white white guy was from Mexico or something. That would be an easy reason to dismiss somebody, right? And then the Peter Galves will say, well, well, no, you got to give the people what they want. They want love OM. And I'm like, well, hang on. You just said <laughs> you can't have it both ways, Peter. You just said they weren't coming to love OM. So all of a sudden, when I say do this, they are coming now. They finally figured it out. I went to see Champion. Now, that's Terrence Blanchard's second opera. 
And both of his operas actually have a, a hero, black man, bisexual, actually. Both Fire Shut Up My Bones and, um, and Champion, about a black boxer who was bisexual, right? It was like a drag show. It was incredible. Not, a, not an empty seat in the entire 3,500. And at the intermissions, I'm like, oh my god, look at these people. It was incredible. And I have to believe that a Peter Gelb would look at that and be like, oh my god, there's money in this, man. We, we can stay alive. Yeah. We can stay alive if we actually put the work in and do something other than Don Giovanni. One of the most sexist operas you could possibly dream up. And I've just never been a fan of Mozart. I don't like his music. So that for me, that's just like, please get rid of Mozart. <laughs> and I, know, I mean, at least Puccini, I like his music. I'm not, but La, not La Boheme, but I like a couple of the other operas. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an extremely difficult thing. I, you know, I actually know the DEI coordinator at the Met. Uh, it's a new position. Her name is Marcia Sells. I was, uh, it's a black woman. A black, of course it is. <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember having a Zoom with her like a year ago. Uh, she reached out, and I'm like, wow, that's really great. And she, they pinched her from Harvard. She was like a dean at the law school. And she was a dancer back in the day, so she had some artistic connections. And it, it's, it was a new hire. They didn't have a DEI coordinator at the Met. But this was post-George Floyd, and everybody was like, just throw some money at it. And that's it. We're good. We are, we've solved the problem. And I remember just saying to Marsha, she was just starting, and I'm like, you know, good luck. You know, let me let me know how it goes. Um, but you know, it's just it's, there's just no way now. DEI, they're all just being cut, and this is just a big pendulum swinging back and forth. It's it's quite silly, obviously. Um, but at any rate, yeah, the, the Met is a, excuse me, it's a, I've got a soft spot in the heart for, in my heart for the Met, but they they're only now beginning to do some good some good programming. It has been way too long, way too long. Um, it's, you know, it's a very, very conservative organization. It's deeply steeped in white supremacy and patriarchy, obviously. And, you know, they could have been doing a lot more a lot sooner, but better late than never, I guess, right? Thank you all so much for, for being here. Yes, thank you all out there. If, you're, if there's still somebody there, thank you.